Hello again, everyone. Same day. Maybe it's a different day for you, but we're just going to do a few of these in a row and get them, get them out, of, out of the way. Um, so today, or the second one, we're going to cover articulation, coordination, flexibility, range building, warm-up routines, and some posture and carriage things. Again, not exhaustive, not in-depth, just informational. And then, of course, in the canvas over to the right, you'll see uh, folders and files, and I've listed and included and dropped a bunch of um, uh, ro routines and articulation exercises and method books and kind of annotated some of this. But um, just for now, I think we'll just kind of gloss through just so you have an idea. So first, articulation uh, and coordination. Articulation and coordination. Most folks don't associate coordination with articulation. How hard is it to go ta, right? And they just, uh, in, most of the time, in, with, with respect to their individual instruments, they just articulation is a natural byproduct of a tongue and air. And it is. The trombone, though, involves, and, well, you know, you have valves on other brass instruments, but the trombone being um, so... Uh, uh, I guess athletic in a way, um, tactile, and having larger muscle groups facilitate note to note to note. So even a half step apart, a lot has to sort of happen exactly in the right place in order for articulation to seem, you know, doable. So the reason why on trombone you have a lot of um, beginners or less advanced students, and perhaps have a bit of a crust in their sound or a little bit of a burr, something on the front of the articulation, generally it's because they're just simply not in the right place at the right time, or they're in a different place every time. So for example, going from F to G, F natural, second line, top, up to the G above that top space. No, nothing to it. However, you string those notes together, going from first to fourth, or even F, uh, G flat, it's even further away, it's in fifth position. It's a, a lot, that wasn't good. Very good. So you have to be able to stay as long as you can and then arrive exactly at the right place. It's all coordination. So that's why articulation and coordination in this section are sort of lumped together. It's very important to make sure that you have both of those. You can articulate and sound like a champion in first position all day long. No problem. You start coordinating uh, or adding other notes to the pile, then it becomes very involved. And so then many times articulation and coordination on trombone is um, uh, somehow it's linked. Well, it is. It's linked um, actually to alternate, alternate positions. So we'll facilitate op alternate positions so that we can um, not just for convenience, but so that it's actually cleaner because we don't have this slush pump action going back and forth. So we want to limit some of that if we can. Rule of thumb, if we're in some place longer than a quarter note or a half note, then we want to tr try to use normal positions. If we're moving quickly through a passage, alternate positions are great, right? Up the chain and down the chain. Um, so an exercise for coordination, the dotted eight sixteenth, it's all over the Arbin book. The syncopation, exercises in Arbin. Um, I will use Koprash. I will use Blager. I'm a big fan of just going through the Arbin book and recording yourself and videotaping and watching just like short little segments. Um, and then I more advanced lyrical playing. So Bordoni is great, but I, I like to do uh, work out of the Snedeker book. And then of course, very advanced um, uh, Pichiru and Biche and things like that later. But for now, just Arbin, very easy, dotted eight sixteen. Exercises like that. For a beginner class, 6th, 7th grade, it's easy to learn a B-flat scale. And then you can do kind of a slide ahead, so you have a metronome going. And you'll make them bop the note, and not move the slide until the next click. Don't move the slide. And what you'll see many times is they're just, they have all day. So move the slide to the last possible moment, and then 
elongate the note in terms of length. And then even longer and with a hard attack. Making sure that there's no smearing or slide noise. When you do this, the left hand has to stay relaxed. I will watch the bell, maybe focus on something on the floor, and make sure that there's not a lot of vibration and bell movement between notes. So there's a lot of shaking. That just means there's tension in the left hand or the right hand. The right hand's along for the ride. You're not carrying a lot of weight, if any. The left hand carries any, uh, all the weight. Anyway, so that's some basic articulation. When we do natural slurs and legato tonguing later, I'll be more specific about the difference and when and where and how to use those. Flexibility, I talked about that in tone production in the last video and how important that is to having a great vibrant sound, being flexible. Um, flexibility is something that you'll be doing in your band program from day one, hopefully. And just um, real simple slurs. It's for, it becomes a warm-up uh, warm procedure, a process that we do every morning, and it becomes more advanced. And it's also helpful for range building later. And uh, many, many Schlossberg, Remington, um, stuff out of the Alessi packet. Um, those files are to the right that will really just help they're great and and uh, again the reason for flexibility is to you know to to have this beautiful legato seamless transition between legato tonguing and natural slurs and then just being able to get around the horn quite simply very very uh important for us to be able to do jazz guys improvisation specialists those who've been playing a lot of i mean that's not a problem for them and generally a well-trained orchestral musician obviously that's not a problem for either but it's it's uh sometimes those band Folks that just kind of play long notes in the back row and like to play really short and percussive, bandy. So to fix the solution that many band directors potentially across the state I've seen is just to make it more together, to make it sound more cohesive and, 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 and on the front, is just have everybody play shorter. Um, that's just generally amateurish, in my opinion. It doesn't sound like a beautiful, it's not a beautiful sound. You know, if it calls for staccato, play staccato, but don't make the band play short and pecky just so we can play together. We have to be able to develop those two skills separately. Uh, and then they combine and come together to make a really great uh, end product. What's the last thing, range building? Oh yeah, range building. So um, we talked about the buzz, buzzing exercises as a range building uh, exercise. <laughs> Painting the barn, applying evenly up top to bottom and keeping the mouthpiece lightly uh, held with the fingers, just touching the mouth and uh, the embouchure enough to make a seal, but nothing further, not pressing. Um, range building has a lot to do with flexibility, has a lot to do with air, and has a lot to do with your technique as far as embouchure. How does air have anything to do with it? When we go up in range, what happens? The air generally speeds up. I hope this doesn't get out, because it could be controversial, but I liken it to a whistle. If you can whistle, <whistles> nothing's happening here. I'm not even moving the aperture. This is the same. What is changing the pitch of the of the whistle is actually what? Whistle? Try it. It's the tai. Going from tai, the articulate the vowel syllable in the shape of the mouth goes from an a ah, o oh, oo oo to a ah, e, right? This isn't I would I didn't know about this until later. I was trying to play everything and my band program as a very young young man with this oh I was taught open, 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 open. Open your throat. Really big sound, you know, a lot of bass trombone teachers in my life. Oh, really open. That's in that, yes, you want to have an open sound, a beautiful, beautiful sound. But you can't play Bolero that way. You can't play Zarathustra that way. You can't play, um, you know, Rhenish that way. I mean, if you can, you maybe can do it once, and then you're done. So it involves an IE. Moving the 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 the, 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 vowel, the tongue back in the in the cavity of the mouth, along with great and a great apparatus here. If you can look, I'm not really. You can see activity. Um, 
I'm not really, there's nothing, there's no stretching. I'm not stretching the mouthpiece of the abishu rather to make a sound go higher. I'm not really pressing any harder. You might see again more activity, muscle activity, but it's just that it's, this is not, this is healthy. Again, the sound is being changed by the air, by, by the cavity, the oral cavity, and of course, you know, going through the partials. And the practice of that is learning where those notes fit, all right? So, I'm sorry, it's, it's been a long spring break. So I will do that and slowly go through the partials. And you can add, you can add um, ease to this by just simply adding a partial. And so you can have your beginner students two and three note and four note, five note slurs gradually. I've always been curious why we start from first and work our way down, because it's getting easier, uh, obviously. But. spectrum. All right. Well thought out. I know. That's exactly what you were thinking. Um, the last thing uh, we'll cover is just some posture and oh, warm-up routines. Again, to the right. The Alessi warm-up routine. The Whitaker warm-up routine. I have a couple over there that you might take a look at. Um, sort of the uh, uh, Mike Davis warm-up routine has a click track. It's very, very cool. It's a lot of fun. You can play. It's good for kids to play, students to play with a click track and have this uh, metronome going just for the timeliness of their breathing and, and then attacks and slide work. It's really great to have, to be accountable with, with, with time and rhythm in that way. Um, yeah, there's so many. So I've listed five over here. You can take a look at those and just kind of be responsible for what they do and kind of where they are and where they're going. And then you can have this resource, of course, later. Um, so two things, warm up. It's a place where warm up, warming up turns into practice. That's good. You want to get there. Um, in, in, I, I immediately get around the horn on, in my warm up. I don't sit there and play long tones. Static long tones is makes me tense. Um, the whole point of warming up is getting up and down and all over the place and getting sort of touching it all. You know, just getting getting ready to go. When I'm cycling or if I'm doing other activities. Um, then there's a whole thing that I process that I go through to get spinning, to get moving, to get going. It, I'm I'm going through the paces. My heart rate is going through several zones, and I'm you know I'm getting what I need to get done, and just kind of feeling each of those zones carefully, and not spending a lot of time there. These long drawn out sessions of, okay, I'm going to do an hour of flexibility. I'm going to do you know this long tone regime. I'm going to have like all my scales you know. I think that's there's a place for that, but that's not really warming up. Then you're kind of working on some foundation, fundamental things. So warming up really consists of about five things. First is just moving the air. Some breathing, up, breathing, buzzing a little bit. You can articulate and buzz. Just go through some scales four, five, six note things, uh, maybe a melody. Um, you can articulate, you can legato tongue, you can smear, right? And then I'm going to be doing a little bit of, um, not starting out with long tones, but starting out with easy slurs. Unfortunately, I can't have the patience for this very long, so I kind of move through the horn. Because I don't have the patience for that, there is a time in my day for long, slow, developed practice. It's just not the warm-up, because it doesn't sound good if I do that. It's later in the day. It's after I'm warmed up. Then, methodical, long tone, sort of long tone development, or slow etudes. I'll pick a couple of etudes and play them at half tempo, just really getting great sound and production from note to note. That's not a warm-up. That's me working on technique and working on other things. I gotta get warmed up first. The next thing I do with warming up, the third thing really is in fact articulation. I'm right into the into the uh, tonguing and stuff, so there'll be some scales and some patterns, right? I've, I've always been a fan of just F descending, right? But then with a with a really relaxed tongue and coordination. Uh, 
That's it. The last thing I'll cover is just posture and carriage. Let's see if I can. You can see the back of my chair. So growing up in Texas, we were required to sit, you know, basically with our our uh, back off the chair, you know, as such. Sorry. And then kind of straight up, and you're not supported. That's fine. But I prefer to have my butt all the way back and then just so that I can kind of feel the chair back here. But when I'm getting into it or I've got to really play, or I just come forward slightly. I'm leading a section, I'm playing, I'm in the, you know, I'm just, I'm attentive and I'm up and I'm, I'm there. I'm not slouched, I'm not reclined most of the time. Um, the other thing would be um, just making sure that your upper body, your neck, chest, this, this whole... Uh, part of your posture and anatomy doesn't change to address the horn. You address the horn by bringing the horn to you. You don't really address, you address a ball if you're going to tee off, but you know, everything changes to meet that ball. It's different in trombone. You're going to, as much as possible, you're going to bring the horn to you. So that this doesn't change, the angle of my head doesn't change, I'm not playing way down, right? I'm not trying to play under the stand. Many, many, many high school kids just kind of are like, Horns in the press box because they have they have no choice because that's what they do most of the time. Uh, my DCI guys traditionally have this sort of attack V going with their elbows, and so you you want just again it's all about relaxed ergonomics, simple slide technique. Everything's in line. The shoulders are down. You're relaxed, and the head basically is just standing. It's the same thing. Not that you have to worry about that too much, but like what I'm not doing is bending over. All right, I'm, I have a curve to my back. Pedal note. All right, last thing. Um, I think uh, as far as carriage is really involves the most the really the most important thing all that is important for breathing and playing but the left hand and then we're done we, we've talked about slide technique and right hand but the left hand um, as far as body carriage the tension starts from a very early age right about here and up in the shoulder translates to here and then it comes back and it kind of goes up into the neck area so if you can take your left hand holding the trombone Make this shape. I don't know what that shape is. It's sort of a whatever. This finger doesn't bend. I broke it a while back, but that's just that's so that's as good as I got. But anyway, basically this way. And the trombone fits. So you're grabbing this brace, the second brace, first brace on the top, forgive me, right next to the mouthpiece um, uh, receiver. And you're just wrapping these three fingers, pinky, ring, and middle, around that first brace. Index finger on the receiver, thumb on your trigger, or if you don't have a trigger, on your crossbar, right? And so the horn just comes up, and you're relaxing, and it's uh, you, the, the, the trombone weight of it is really pretty much on the pad of your hand, right? Have your students learn to hold the trombone with the pinky finger on the slide. So here's the three, right? I'm going to address it again. I'm just grabbing these three fingers, going around that, index finger on the receiver, thumb on the uh, trigger or the cross brace, and then never let them ever, from day one, pick up the trombone like this. The slide inevitably will, will be locked or unlocked, and boom, it'll drop the slide, it'll come right off. So always grab the trombone this way, with the pinky uh, finger underneath the slide brace, right? Make sense? Sl unlock and lock, doesn't matter. You just never hold the trombone any other way. You have see kids walking around like this, I guarantee you their slide is a disaster. So just keep that right there and you're good to go. All right. One more video. Bye. You guys have a good one. See you soon.